We are here at the Fort Devens Museum in what used to be called Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Now it's just plain Devens. And we're here with the director, Kara Fossey. Mm -hmm. And Kara's going to do a little walk around this uh, nice little museum. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Um, so before I start to walk around, I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, the museum itself. Um, so when Fort Devens was an active base, um, there was a Fort Devens Museum here. It was located down where the main gate is. Uh, but when Fort Devens closed in 1996, the museum closed too. Um, so any, you know, memories that anyone has of the Fort Devens Museum here is a separate museum from us. Mm, okay. um, we started a little bit after the base closed, um, just a group of people in the area who were interested in saving the history. Uh, so we're a private nonprofit. Um, um, so we're not part of the army that's still here in some you know regard, and we're not part of the state either. So that's the army national guard is here, right? Um, there's reserves, reserves here, reserves. and there's also national guard. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually think that there's little training areas um, or smaller units of almost every branch of the military mm -hmm. stationed here. Still, it's just on a much smaller scale than it was. Um, so we're a private nonprofit, um, so we depend on memberships and donations. And, and you have a website. We do, yeah, fortdevons.org, so okay. that's there. And we have a Facebook, too. I update that pretty frequently, oh, so great. that's where you can find a lot of kind of, you know, updated information. And you're open? So we're open on Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 until 3, okay. and also the third Saturday of each month. Okay. And on those third Saturdays, um, you can check our website, but traditionally we have a program at 1 o'clock on those days, and that's sort of a variety of topics. We just had one this past Saturday that was a panel of um, individuals who grew up during World War II. So it was just sort of a you know panel oh, okay. discussion of different... And I believe were Italian prisoners of war right here? There was a prisoner of war camp um, yeah. during World War II. It was mostly German. Germans. We talk about that there may have been a few Italians, but most of the Italians were in Boston, um, you know, in the harbor. Oh, yeah. Um, so most of the ones here were German. There were about 5,000 wow. at that time. And that was between 1944 and 1946. Mm. So... Yeah, so, so anyway, so um, we start out, you know, start at the beginning, um, which was Camp Devens was built in, uh, in starting in June 1917. Um, and the reason that this area was chosen was because there was already the railroad running from Boston into the center of air, which is just a mile or so down mm -hmm. the road. So they thought that this would be easy to get both materials and people up here. So that's why they chose this location. Um, they built the camp super, super quickly. Um, um, over a period of about 10 weeks or so, they were building this camp that was designed for at least 10,000 soldiers, although at one point there was closer to 30,000 here at one point. Um, so they built railroad sidings that brought materials in. Um, and again, it, you know, it was kind of funny to be building almost this small city in the middle of these few small towns. Um, the area that they ended up using encompassed portions in Air, Harvard, and Shirley. So it had sort of portions of all of those towns in here. Um, and that land was originally leased from landowners. The, the, the War Department leased that land from them. So, um, But you can imagine just all the wooden buildings. You know, if you look at the panoramics that just lined, you know, the landscape there. And, of course, it looked very different in general. There weren't as many trees as there are today. So. Oh, it's very well. Uh, it's a beautiful spot. It is. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's very nice. Even so, when it was opened, it was still a lot yeah, of very wooded yeah. and... Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people have fond memories of it anyway, so. Um, so during World War I, um, there were two divisions that were here. Um, the big one is the 76th Division that trained here, and they trained here before they did go overseas to Europe. Um, and the 12th Division was also here, though they did not end up going overseas. Um, and there are no buildings left from that time period, so you see we have a guard shack model, you know, guard house here. So, have to rebuild the buildings that aren't here anymore anyway. Um, and there are little remnants left around base that, you know, sort of let you know that you're looking at something different than just a regular town. Um, that bottom picture there is a pillbox that was done by the 301st Engineers. And that's still standing. You can walk up in the woods and see that there. So again, just little items that sort of dot the landscape that they'll let you know that there was a different purpose for this area. Um, so one of the things that we try to do at the museum is really focus on the individuals that came through here. So if we have a uniform, we try to show who wore it, what he or she was doing when they were here. Um, because a lot of our visitors have personal connection to Devons. Either they trained here themselves, um, or they had a family member who did. So they're sort of coming back for that personal mm -hmm. experience anyway. Um, so again, like for like instance. Like me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we have this gentleman, um, Lieutenant James Mansfield, who, Mansfield, excuse me, who was from Concord. And he was actually killed in action in France um, during World War One, 
and he was part of the 26th Yankee Division. Um, the 26th did not train here as a whole, um, even though they're made up of mostly New England guys. A couple guys trained here and then were placed in the 26th, and then some smaller units trained. Um, but they ended up coming back here after they returned from World War I. So, and then after World War I happened, um, in a sort of surprising move, the War Department actually purchased all that land that they had previously been leasing. Um, so that was kind of the first step in making Devons kind of a permanent fixture um, in this area. And so what was going on during the 20s um, was there were National Guard training here, um, but there was also what was called CMTC, Citizens Military Training Camps. And those were kind of like four week long summer programs um, for young men, and it was designed to just uh, teach them basic military training under no obligation to join the Army. Right. Afterwards. And what year was this? Um, this went all the way from uh, the 20s up to 41. It may have even been oh, 21 to 40. And this yeah. was federal based or state based? Um, it was federal. federal yeah. um, there were there were these camps, you know, were in a couple different areas, um, and again, and you could actually learn, you know, you could learn artillery, um, you know, infantry. It was a couple different things that yeah. you could. That you so could four do. weeks that you can. I believe it was just four weeks. Well, most basic training at two months, so you'd probably get a good idea of what. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. yeah, and that's so. I mean, they did that, you know, I think every summer during those years. Um, so in our collection, we don't have every year by any means, but we'll have yearbooks, mm -hmm. you know, that show, you know, which guys were there during which summer, and that's cool because they actually usually list the full name and the hometown, oh. um, which is kind of interesting. So a lot of people, you know, were able to do some family, you know, history by looking through those as well. Um, and we have a couple other things here. There was, we, we got this great scrapbook um, a little while ago that was from a telephone operator here at Camp Devons. Yeah. And I can't remember where she was from. It and it was Western called Mass. Camp Devons up until what time? 1931-1932 uh, is when they changed it. So. so it was camp all the way up until that point. And that actually goes right into the section. Um, all right, so in the late 1920s, um, there was a new building project that went on here, and they started building permanent buildings. So obviously the old ones were all the wooden structures. These ones that started up in the late 20s were made of brick. Um, some of them you can still see if you go down to the historic district today. So once again, that building of those structures was one more step in sort of making this a permanent um, fixture in the area. Um, and then so moving into the early 30s, um, 1931 to 1932 was when they officially changed the name from Camp Devons to Fort Devons. And that was um, in part because of Congresswoman Edith Norse Rogers. She was very interested in making this a permanent post um, here. So she worked with um, Colonel Foreman, who was the commander of Fort Devons at the time, and they had that official renaming ceremony in 1932. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the last step in saying, you know, here's And she was a congresswoman stay. from this district? Well, Lowell. Lowell, yeah. yeah. Yep, and so. I see the pillows. Oh, yeah, they are down here. Well, yes. Camp Constitution donated a uh, pillowcase, and uh, these are really nice-looking ones. Well, too. and you can yeah. see that the one you was brought Same, in is different. So, so to say, yeah, 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 with the frills. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So um, so once, you know, World War II started, um, there was sort of this another large building campaign here. You know, they were getting ready to host another infantry uh, division here. So they built a whole bunch of new wooden barracks. Um, they also built two new hospital complexes. Mm -hmm. So there was just a lot going on. I here. remember the hospital. It's one floor. Yep, it's yep. about a mile long. Yeah, they were connected by like these skinny little yeah. hallways. And if you could put, if you could stand it up, it'd be one of the biggest buildings in right. the country. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, um, and again, there were a couple infantry divisions that, that trained here during that time. Um, the first is notable. Um, we have a couple uniforms in the other room um, for that. So, uh, and the 45th actually was another um, division that trained here at least to some extent. And then... Let me get the pot belly stove. Oh, that was probably in, in the barracks, right? Yeah, that was in, we actually have a picture over there, a World War II picture, a World War I, excuse me, photo, and you can see it in that room. I know, if you can imagine. They took, oh, here, and here is a uh, prototype or a model of the... Uh, oh, yes. Yes, here is our... This is our World War II model. I can embarrass our builder who's standing right outside the mm. door here. <laughs> so this is our final, this is the only World War II barracks that, that's left at Devon's now, so. Yeah. Which is nice to have that. They, they tore the last ones down around 2006. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So. 
I remember staying in some of the yeah. World War II barracks, yeah. the wooden barracks. Yeah, we've had a lot of people yeah. come back and say, even, yeah, pretty late on, I mean, even in like the 70s or the 80s or something, saying they remembered, yeah. you know, staying we in one. We used in, one in the reserve unit I was in in the early 90s. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, we went to mid-80s. Mid yeah. yeah. Well, and someone had come in and told this story kind of recently, um, how he was in one of these old wooden barracks and that he woke, the window next to him was broken and he woke up in the morning and there was just snow like all over his blanket <laughs> that had blown in during the night, so... <laughs> Um, so also uh, notable during the 40s was there was a prisoner of war camp here, um, as we mentioned. Uh, so that was between 1944 and 1946, and there were about 5,000 POWs are here, mostly German. Um, we have a couple uh, jewelry boxes on display. But they were treated pretty well here, weren't they? As far as we know, um, and that's based yeah. on memoirs that we have. The story, the story from last weekend that one of the guest lecturers gave was... The worst incident they heard about was that one of the guards taking them out for some work detail, because they, they used to farm them out and you could, get, mm -hmm. you could hire out POWs. A friend of mine, his father used to hire them to pick apples. Well, this guard got tired of watching the, carrying his rifle around, gave his loaded rifle to a POW and said, here, you carry it. <laughs> <laughs> like a sergeant, American version of Sergeant Schultz. Huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and what's your name, sir? Andy Tabak. But yeah, I understand there were some romances of the POWs, and some of them came <laughs> back and married some of the gals. Well, uh, yeah, it's, I, I, a friend of my mother's married a, a German POW. Oh, fascinating, she was, she was yeah. An Irish girl from Boston. She married a, a guy that was, it was air defense, and then he ended up on an e-boat, and uh, when they evacuated after losing North Africa, they loaded so many German soldiers on his e-boat, it capsized, and they got captured, and... Oh. He ended up finishing high school in a POW camp in Britain. Wow, and that's something. Ended yeah. up as a professor of history down in North Carolina. Gee, that's mm -hmm. an incredible but, story. But yeah. they yeah. sorted out the POWs. So this being liberal Massachusetts, we got the left-wing uh, Germans. <laughs> they were, were non-party member ones. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. they got the ones here to sign a petition to encourage Germany to surrender. And really? Yeah. Wow, yeah. interesting. So well, my had, dad, my... had hardcore ones out remote areas. My dad was in North Africa in the, during the war, and then to Sicily, and then eventually Germany. And he said the Italian prisoners uh, were laughing and then saying, "We're going to Amer America. Well, you go to Italy." He said, <laughs> like, you know, in your face. You know? <laughs> and he said they used to uh, the Italian prisoners would would do all the laundry. They weren't worried about them trying to escape right. or anything well, like that. Well, they yeah. they ran the mess halls here in Devon yeah. that the Germans did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our members, uh, his house was kept uh, the the coal in the furnace was kept stoked by an Italian POW. Wow, interesting. But uh, all the local hospitals here had German orderlies. Wow. Down on the Boston waterfront was run by Italian POWs. Mm -hmm. But something. they said that 90% of the Italian POWs after Italy surrendered, they voluntarily helped the Allied war effort. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, POWs weren't supposed to do war-related things. They, you could hire them or force them into labor to do like farm work and right. that sort of thing. But uh, it, it did end after the war. They did use Germans to move ammunition. Any uh, Germans have reached out to this, uh, reached out to you folks? Uh, those who have been, there might had, be still yeah, some living, members, right? Least, yeah. Well, we, we, yeah, we, have, we had a couple of family members come yeah. by a couple of years ago. And their father is still living, but they felt he was um, too old to yeah. make the trip oh, out that's here. Fascinating. Um, yeah. But even a couple of years ago, I mean, I had spoken to, to one guy um, who was living in France. And he was still around. He sent us a couple, you know, some information, oh, sort of like a yeah. memoir type thing. So, yeah. and we do have memoirs from a few other, you know, you have it on video. Well, so we yeah. don't. Oh, know. that'd be good to get on video. Too. I know. And I guess before, no, this was before. I think the museum was formed, maybe. But I know there was a newspaper article from the '90s or early 2000s where one gentleman mm -hmm. from Germany did come back and you know, oh. kind of toured the area yeah, yeah. And, and looked around. Oh, so, and again, a lot of them had you know, sort of fond memories. I mean, to some extent, of course, of, yeah. you know, of yeah. being here, well, yeah. but. You're going to recognize, well, they, they did like it, a lot of them, but they also sorted them out. So mm -hmm. to some degree, ones that you talk to that were around New England, they, they tended to be, you know, ones that didn't want to support Hitler right. anyway. They were just uh, drafted and, yeah. you know, yeah. and they yeah. weren't, they weren't yeah. ideologues. They were so, just You know, uh, the, S, the SS were stuck out in remote areas yeah. under tight security, yeah. but the, these other guys. Yeah. I, I mean, I heard up in Canada they had some logging camps where they, the leadership, not just some... Mm -hmm. Sergeant Schultz type guard, but the leadership would select out the fo uh, forest meisters, and they would issue them rifles and ammunition to go forage for the uh, logging camps mm -hmm. oh. by themselves. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah.
There's an old-fashioned CD player right there. Huh? <laughs> yes, too bad. We, we sometimes crank that up and get it going. Yeah. We did a silent night on here somewhere oh, today that's nice, uh, for yeah. the season. But it's wow. interesting to see the generational differences. <laughs> I have a Victrola, and some uh, a lady was in her 30s, so her son went, what's that? I said, it's an old-fashioned CD. You know, it's right. an old-fashioned MP3 player. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> Always another, uh, another pillowcase. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a little different that than the other ones. To, to yeah. the hospital that was here. So yeah. this is, you know, this this deals with the the World War II era hospitals um, mm -hmm. that were here, and as you said, it was all sort of one story buildings connected by series of, you know, covered hallways and passages. So you can see we have a bunch of the panoramic photos um, as well. And Company C, United States Army Security Agency. So. This entity was here for until the end. The security agency, right? This where they trained a lot of. Um, yeah, they they moved. Let's see, they moved here in 1951 um, and stayed. I don't know what date exactly, but I mean all the way, mostly up to when the base when the base, the closed. base closed. And that's what a lot of the people that we get back here were with the ASA. Uh -huh. um, and we don't, you know, we have a small ASA display. We don't have as much as we would like. Um, Probably still top secret. <laughs> that's what I always tell everyone who visits. Ah, that's why we it's don't have secret, anything. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we got this, uh, it looks like an early, was it M16A1? M16, yeah. Yep. This was, you know, m moving up into, you know, Vietnam era. Um, there were several special forces groups that were here, but I mean, most notably was the 10th Special 10 Forces. 10 Special Forces, yeah. um, Who were here. Same thing, I mean, for late 60s, I think they were late here, 60s, all the way yeah. up until the 90s. So, I um, mean, that's actually something else that we're hoping to, you know, slowly get some more items to mm -hmm. beef up that display, too, because again, they were here for so long. It looks um, like a law. Is that a laws rocket? That's what that looks like. Yeah. Expertise. Is that what that is? <laughs> Yeah, light anti-tank weapon, OS. Yeah, throw, throw, uh, law, yeah, throw away, throw away the rock, throw right. away, yeah. Mm -hmm. One shot and you're done, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Stars and Stripes Forever, I like that. The uh, Soldier at a Cross. So, if people would like to learn more about the website, yeah, I, I would say check the website, um, but again, check our Facebook. Um, that has a lot and of... And if you have fond memories of the camp, yes. or may even be able to want to make a donation right. to it. Uh, well, and that's, I mean, you know, truthfully, we're certainly, as a, a private nonprofit, you know, we're always looking for financial support, um, but also, uh, you know, we're we always looking for donation of items, um, and as you just mentioned, stories as well, because, you know, that's a big... A big part of it too is we really put it on a video and yeah, get yeah. over to you folks yeah, yeah. yeah. okay I mean, well, that'd be fun because everyone has these fun little stories you know it's funny to see what sticks in people's heads so i remember using some of the uh, mosquito repellent we got here and the stuff was like gasoline you could probably it was banned anywhere else but <laughs> it would not only it would kill anything in sight mosquitoes and uh, uh -huh. it was terrible but it worked we never got any mosquito <laughs> bites uh, all right, well, again, thank you for your time. And, folks, if you're watching this, please, um, if you're ever in this area uh, and want to communicate with them, please do so. And their website is uh, fortdevonsmuseum.org. Fort okay, thank you. All right. Thank